Hello everyone, it's Richard Lewis here with another video. Today I'm going to be talking about something that I, I think I have a little bit of insight into that maybe some of the other people that have been talking about it, especially just, you know, Redditors, uh, might not uh, have the same level of insight. I guess we'll see. Uh, but that is, I want to talk a little bit about coaching uh, in CSGO. But specifically, I want to use that as a kind of jumping off point to talk about Peacemaker, uh, the Brazilian coach who's had kind of a, a strange career of late um so let's just start a little bit by setting it up uh, by, by talking about uh you know coaching methodology now i've been a, a sports coach uh at very low levels you know you're not going to see me with my um you know ua for coaching badges or anything like that i did think about it at one time um but uh, I used to work with a sports writer uh, that was doing his uh, over at another publication and he would sort of like, you know, the day job would be getting his UA for coaching badges for, you know, football. And, uh, you know, the, the night job would be writing articles about football. So it kind of looked like really cool. And I was like, yeah, maybe I'll give this a go. But obviously um, esports kind of took off in a big way and, and w was a, a means to kind of, um, you know, me make the uh, living that I do now. But anyway, so I've done it at like an amateur level. I've done, you know, kids rugby, uh, women's rugby, uh, boxing, you know, this kind of stuff. And uh, I, I think you can, with team sports, you can kind of break down the two philosophies, the two core philosophies at least, into two very distinct uh, philosophies. And that is that the, the first is that you look at your team and you look at all of the parts, you know, all of the moving parts, you individually assess every player, you look at their skills, um, you look at their room for development, you look at their adaptability, you look at everything and, and you quickly start to learn uh, in training uh, what the team's strengths are what an individual's strengths are, what their capacity for growth is going to be, uh, what roles they may be able to transition into. Uh, it's very often when you're doing youth coaching, especially, you'll see some guy whose dad has been, you know, like I'm saying dad, you know, but the parents have a very clear idea about what they want their kid to be. Oh, you're going to be a striker, son. You're going to be a striker. You know, kid can't head the ball. Kid can't hold up the ball. Uh, it doesn't look like they're going to develop into having that upper body strength, but they are quick uh, and they've got good technique uh, with, with shooting. And it, it, you know, it's same with rugby. Oh, you know, you're going to be going to be a winger, son. It's like, yeah, then uh, once you get into Colts level and adult level, you still have to have a bit about you. You know, actually what you've got here is uh, someone that should probably learn to be scrum half. But, um, you know, as the coach, you get to kind of undo that and, and, and take them out of their preconceptions, out of the roles they want, and put them into roles that they're better suited to. Um, so, yeah, basically, you can sum that up just by saying you play t to your strengths. You play to your strengths. You take a team and you build uh, a, a system around the players you have that works. The other philosophy in coaching is that you have a very clear and distinct idea about the way any game should be played and you take your players and you teach them that system and if players don't adapt if players can't learn that system if players don't fit into that system if players don't like or approve that system you do a nominal amount of training before you look to replace them and uh, you, once you uh, set those wheels in motion, you find players that you either trial or players you've worked with before who you know can fit into that system and you bring them into the fold. And ultimately, the system is king. You have your dominant philosophy and that is what you bring to the team. It's, it's the system. You don't necessarily have any great coaching or people skills or motivational skills uh but, but what you do have is a great understanding of how to get everybody to fit into a system that works now i'm going to say something that i think people will find controversial uh and, and I'll, I'll be honest i'm biased uh because of how i used to approach team coaching i was always the first one 
Uh, I was always the former rather than the latter, uh, because I think uh, you can be successful with any team if you can play to your strengths. And that's how I used to deem success. You know, are we punching above our weight? Does this, do, do, does this core... Uh, philosophy that I'm currently working with these players is everybody achieving the level they should or greater that that's how I used to measure success rather than even something like winning games uh, which is very pigeonholy you know it's very it's very limiting if you if, if the only thing that matters in coaching is the win um, a lot of amateur coaches and a lot of low-level coaches are going to be incredibly disappointed uh, because it's resource dependent it's you know it's skill set dependent you have a high churn especially at junior level you work with these players for a couple of years sometimes and that's it and basically what you're doing is giving them tools and and and, and training them and you move them on to the next system provided you know the next uh sorry the next stage of the, the, the system that gets them to being a pro uh and i think that's incredibly difficult uh, honestly, uh, and certainly a lot more difficult than just this is the way I want you to play. If you can't play, I, you're not in the team. Um, now, I, I, again, I could be wrong. That's my belief from having done this. But uh, as I said, I am biased, so take it with a pinch of salt. But um, with, with CS coaching, I think we all too often see ineffective coaches in those two areas definitely there's there's people who clearly believe one or the other but uh, what tends to happen is that the people that believe that oh we'll just have a working you know we'll, we'll, we'll just see what we can do and play to our strengths a lot of them aren't really coaches at all i mean you, you see a lot of people who are getting an easy ride uh x players that are friends with other players that get brought into an organization get to draw a salary when it wouldn't be feasible if they were a player to do that anymore and they're not really doing a lot for their money i mean that they're, they're, they're stealing a check basically or you get people like what i believe peacemaker to be and that is that just incredibly rigid and inflexible wants complete control and also wants to have the clout to be able to say to the organization this player needs replacing go and buy a player uh, i want this player please go and buy this player uh, and i don't think cs is there yet either i think those coaches are delusional uh, honestly now i'm going to preface the all of this this peacemaker part by saying obviously i've got nothing against the guy like the guy will extend an invitation should he decide to watch this uh come on the podcast and let's talk about coaching in counter-strike would love to pick his brains i think he's a smart dude but as a coach i think he's entered into this kind of um downward spiral because of his own inflexibility in his core beliefs and and sometimes i think you've got to change you've got to move with the times or you're going to shit all over your own legacy and you're going to make things incredibly hard for yourself. So, uh, I, I, I think this is an interesting discussion because I, I've talked about this just actually after the uh, Clash for Cash. Uh, me and Moses stayed up and had a few whiskeys as, as, as we usually do. And we did talk about this. We talked about uh, whether or not coaches in Counter-Strike should have complete control over the team, whether they should be benching players, whether they should be fining players, whether they should be dictating the roster. Now, Moses believes absolutely yes. Uh, and and I don't, I, I kind of do in a way, but I don't think we're there yet. And I don't think it's realistic. And I'm not too sure it should entirely be the coach. Uh, maybe, but, but the idea of fining, I'm not too sure I like that. The idea of benching, possibly I, su I suppose you know that's something you do in a, a regular a uh, sports coaching role but honestly I, I i gotta say i i think the key thing with coaching in, in counter-strike is that you should be there to do exactly that to take players that have tunneled in on how they play the game and teach them something new teach them a way to think about the game show them a mistake uh give them some quick improvement points show them how to be more expansive you know break down some basic exercises and and teach them how to perhaps be a little bit more open-minded in their approach or to try things outside 
of their comfort zone uh, and, and, and broaden their skill set. I, I think ultimately that's all you're going to be able to do as things stand. And I think all the other powers that, that a lot of these coaches want, I definitely believe players shouldn't be in charge of a roster. Right? I think that goes without saying. I think when that happens, when players are in charge of a roster, we recycle the same old shit players. Players pretend they're completely free of bias and only they understand the game. And that an analyst couldn't, or a coach couldn't, or a manager couldn't, or a fan couldn't. That only they can. Well, they do have a perspective that those group of people will never have. But equally, that doesn't mean that that perspective alone is the only perspective you should have when you think about the, the game. And I've seen players do inexplicable things, like bring players in to a team going, yep, this is the, one of the best teammates I've ever played. Look, I don't give a fuck if he gives you a tuggy in the fucking bath. Uh, what's he going to do on the server? You know, I don't give a fuck if he knows exactly how you like a cup of tea. What's he going to do on the server? How is he going to fit into a unit? You know, how, how, and a lot of the time, the players put that need of comfort over the need of, of winning. Um, sometimes players get rid of other players because they argue and they don't understand that sometimes some of the best teams have that creative friction, have people with different belief systems, different philosophies, different personalities. You know, you think about any team that's been built around a star player and, and understand how weird that must be. And yet we don't even have different salaries. I mean, we get again, we're getting there in Counter-Strike, but for the most part, everyone gets the same salary, which is absurd, isn't it? I mean, but that that's to protect ego. That's to protect fragile little egos who couldn't look over at a guy who's 10 times better than them. And because they're making two times the salary, oh, this isn't fair it's exactly fair if anything it's uh, less fair than it should be um so uh, there's there's lots of nuance and there's lots of interesting developments i you know but like i say the idea that players should be in control of the roster never really sat right with me um and i see a lot of players that have come out recently and i think it was kind of precipitated a little bit by this peacemaker issue you know saying players uh, should always control the roster Nah, completely disagree with that. Uh, definitely have a say, definitely have an input, definitely give your insight. But at the end of the day, it's the manager that goes and does the buyout. It's the manager that pays the the, the checks, you know, the manager or owner. Uh, and the coach should, should definitely have a say in it as well because they've got to work with them. And they might be a coach that has a system and they know the system works, but they want people to fit into that system. So let's talk a little bit about Peacemaker. Uh, now, Peacemaker reminds me of a character, actually um in, in not a character that makes him sound like he's fictitious he's not he's real uh, a guy called uh, uh andre villaboas and if you've ever um followed uh, football or, or for my american friend soccer uh you'll know a little bit about him this guy was earmarked to be the next big thing he was going to be the replacement for Mourinho. portugal had produced another special one people couldn't believe it you know one of triple domestically with Porto uh, in his, um, you know, kind of first season. And his eye, everybody was like, this guy's going to be a god. Well, it didn't turn out that way because Villa Boas had a system and it didn't translate. It didn't translate to foreign leagues. Uh, it certainly didn't translate to Chelsea. It didn't translate to a, a dressing room full of star players. He was the same age um, as some of the senior players or, you know, like a couple of years older uh, than some of the senior players in the dressing room. He didn't even have that gravitas of being older. And he found it incredibly hard. Yet, did he change? Did he change his philosophy? No, he didn't. And it cost him. Now he's managing in the fucking Chinese League or something. I'll bring it to his Wikipedia page so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, but, uh, yeah, he... he he, his entire career, it started on this super high and then just his own rigidity and inflexibility and refusal to adapt just saw it swirl down the toilet to the point where, yep, I'm sure he's making money. But China, you know, you've, you've gone from managing Chelsea for one year, being heralded as the replacement for Mourinho. Now you're managing uh, out in uh, the, the Chinese leagues. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a hell of a fall. And I, I see a lot of similarities here. With Peacemaker now, Peacemaker obviously Brazilian guy started, uh, you know, with with the the Brazilian Games Academy team, and had a very good long run and set them up for success, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, you can see here this is the Games Academy side, and it was kind of a secondary organization that was founded by uh, Fallen. 
we no point in getting into the you know ifs and buts about that uh, but you can see here on liquipedia uh, you know th there was a, there was this is when the the team kind of came into existence in August 2015 and Peacemaker was part of the original team and you can see here you know they were doing as expected i mean but this is before but you know kind of you know we we realized the strength and depth of the brazilian scene and peacemaker was very kind of instrumental if you like in in developing uh some of this talent but that being said there this this was a team that uh how how should we put this there was a lot of moving parts around this team there was a lot of influence from fallen there was a lot of support uh from the brazilian you know team that fallen was in the core team the brazilian community and i'd say ultimately peacemaker had a very easy job and certainly i've been told by players that peacemaker while he was here yes he was a coach yes he would do you know kind of demo analysis and and, and help the guys and kind of be a facilitator but he didn't really get to impress his beliefs on 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 the team in the sense that he wasn't going to these players and saying right this is this is what we do and this is all we do there's some very big personalities in that team and, and they had their own philosophies and their own ideas about how to play the game and it was more a committee approach so after that uh after and again as a good run that team moved to tempo storm but peacemaker didn't go with them he was now well regarded enough to command a a position in a North American team and, and make some money. Okay. Now Team Liquid were in fucking disarray. I mean, Team Liquid has probably been all round one of the most expensive flops. You think about where FaZe is now, at least FaZe turned a corner and is winning tournaments and is challenging for shit. You think about Team Liquid, certainly didn't spend the same amount of money as FaZe, but definitely spent a lot within Counter-Strike uh, terms. And they've had those runs to major semi-finals, major finals, you know, on the on the shoulders of Simple. Um, but beyond that, it's just been a rotation, like just a revolving door of expensive flops. And they've fallen very short of, of what where they should be now by the way that isn't a criticized team liquid like i might not necessarily get along with steve arhan said i think he's an incredibly two-faced duplicitous piece of shit uh just to summarize that um you know this is a guy who who says one thing in in person and then goes out and absolutely crucifies you publicly i got no time for that um but i admire the philosophy of here is a paycheck here is, uh, um, what do we need? You know, I'll go get us some talent. Uh, I loved their approach to Cooster, even though, again, that sort of didn't work out. It should have done. I don't know why it didn't. I guess looking back, he did need that micromanagement. And they've always spent money to get better. That is the idea. It's a shame on that basis it hasn't worked out for them, okay? Because it, it should have, but it didn't. It never did. And like I say, I admire anybody that's willing to put their money where their mouth is and go out and chase the fucking you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I got to, I got to admire that philosophy. So, however, I might feel about the organization, the way it's run, the, their approach to journalism, their approach to social media, their, sometimes their approach to even how they handle their own players. Uh, at the end of the day, just as a philosophy of will spend to be successful, I, I respect that. I respect that a lot. Um, so Peacemaker comes into Team Liquid, and some of the stories coming out of Team Liquid, dude, at that time, are pretty fucking crazy. I mean, the team is effectively dysfunctional anyway. Um, you've got uh, you've got players in that team that pretty much call the shots and pretty much run it. I mean, I, I suppose there's no point in hiding the fact that Alige has been hugely influential. Uh, you know, all the instances where there's been roster you know roster swaps and, and and internal friction uh elise has kind of been at the, the the forefront of that and you know he recently responded to uh hiko coming out and kind of being honest about that and said look you know i've made mistakes but um it's not quite the way hiko told it obviously no one's singular version is going to encompass all the nuance of any particular story 
but it, it, it it's concerning when when a player has that level of influence. Now I don't know if Peacemaker was brought in kind of and was going to be like the the union buster or something, if you like, in the sense that he was going to be this this guy. But um, had a had an incredibly tough time. I mean, it's always been alluded to he didn't get along with you know like Pimp, for example, who criminally uh, it's criminal he failed at, at Team Liquid because Pimp is such a good player. He's missed the, he was out of contention just as Danish CS started to really propel itself to the forefront where you've got two teams in the top five now and probably will for a long long time and Pimp's out of that roster shuffle. He's a better player than that. He could be in one of those teams. He's not. He went to NA. It should have been a marriage made in heaven. It wasn't. He had a terrible time, and I don't think he had the support around him because you know, Jacob can be a little bit of a, a, a bitch at times in the sense that you know he he, he he wants things to be his way as well. But I think as he's got older, he's learned how to compromise. Well, apparently, uh, that that's something Peacemaker didn't have. And a lot of people... Uh, around that team have told me that actually he had a very strict rigid and inflexible approach and summarized it as sort of my way or the highway i don't know like i say i don't know if team liquid brought him in to do that but with some of the players they had with the level of influence they had and you know elise just keeps getting better and better which his star power gives him the, the right to have influence uh it was it was a disaster it was too many cooks and Imagine what it's like to be an experienced player like sort of Hiko in that environment and everything else. Uh, so tough, tough environment for the players. And Peacemaker kind of arrived on that scene and, and honestly didn't really achieve as much as he could have done. But that's not, that's, I'm not going to blame him for that uh, because Team Liquid haven't achieved as much as they could have done. I mean, that's just part and parcel of being on the team liquid books right like if the team fails and you're the coach then you fail too but the the, the issue i i think a lot of people had was that um he he was kind of not facilitating success you know he was he was creating internal issues by having a very strict approach to how he wanted things to be now i've also got to say as well in counter-strike if you're the kind of guy who's like, well, I want you to go out and buy five brilliant players. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it's not really coaching at this point. You're creating a fucking fantasy team, you know? Uh, the, the whole point of a coach, for, for my money, is you take something that's uh, here and you move it ever so slightly to here. Think about what Threat did when he was at NIP. There was never any sort of uh, issue about him coming in and being like, right, well, we've got to fucking change this roster. You're all old. You're all fucked up. He was like, no, 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 no. Here's a tactical system that's going to work, and I'm going to call for you, uh, and I'll be there in your ear. And, of course, the Valve ruling, which affected Peacemaker as well, uh, and on all coaches, uh, affected Threat and, and took NIP backwards. I think if they'd been allowed to sort of keep that, uh, I think Threat would have been very effective moving forward. So then uh, he's out of Team Liquid, right? He he Peacemaker doesn't work he goes, and he's just out twisting in the wind. Now, at this point, he's still got a very intact reputation. People think, well, it's Team Liquid. Anyone who goes over there says it's a little bit fucked up. They don't have anyone with the authority to kind of, you know, crack the whip and bring everybody in the line. So, ah, we'll, we'll sort of forgive him for that. And then he went and he had a trial with Optic. Now, Optic were in a similar position to uh to, to team liquid in the sense that you know they've got these big personalities big developing talent in na and they were coming up and you're like well let's get peacemaker in you know this makes sense the, let's take ourselves to the next level let's get a coach in who knows what they're doing has a system and can uh you know contribute in that way well he went there on trial and this was at the same time uh, you know, that they lost the, the in-game leader Stanislaw, so they needed uh, somebody with a tactical approach to the game. But Optic, it just didn't fit. Uh, and you can see here, Mixwell came out and said, Peacemaker's approach did not match the team style, saying the Brazilian was too emotional sometimes. And that, again, 
that lines up with what we heard at Team Liquid. Not only does he have a demand for the system he has, the approach he has, to be perfectly executed all the time and for people to do exactly what he wants, he gets very upset when they don't. Now, come on. This is... Uh, th th there's too many people saying this for this not to be true. Okay? And, and Peacemaker might go, oh, that's really unfair. Sometimes people lack self-perception and self-awareness. And I would, I would argue that if he was going to come out and go, yeah, all of these people saying this about me, it's just, it's just a fiction. It, it, it would be a ridiculous assertion, and, and you might want to revise that opinion. But Mixwell certainly said it. People in Team Liquid certainly said the same thing. And it was basically presented to the optic management that, nah, we, we don't want him in. Um, you know, Mixwell and, and, and Rush almost joined team liquid because they respected uh stanislaw's approach to the game and stanislaw's in-game leadership i mean you know stan is probably one of na's dirty little secrets he i've talked to the guy we we did we did a uh program over at uh, e-league which I, I don't even know if it if we used it but it was you know we sat down we had a long talk and uh, you know this guy's smart and he's got a very good approach to the game and a uh, very calming influence, not emotional. So that's what Optic we're used to. So you can, P Peacemaker and Stan, it's day and night, you know? So it didn't work out. And you can see here, uh, Peacemaker himself responded because, you know, Peacemaker is a man who has penned many a twit longer. And uh, he says here, after losing Stanislaw, the team lost leadership and guidance and internal problems started to happen with the defeats coming in. You know, this is absolutely true. There was definitely friction within Optic. As, and this is why Mixwell and Rush were looking for the door. And without Stanislaw to be the mediator, which is another big part of coaching or in-game leadership, you mediate and you do conflict resolution. Uh, very often in Counter-Strike, that's what a lot of these coaches and managers actually spend their time doing uh but with nobody there to do that the team was starting to eat itself and you can see peacemaker there we tried to handle all, all of this as best as we could but with all the rumors about mixwell rush leaving the liquid i felt the team completely lost motivation to continue working so we barely practiced after katavica i have a particular way of coaching my teams great a very particular way and I may not be the best when it comes to dealing with a lot of problems, but I have my own system, which worked very well with my previous teams, but unfortunately did not work with Optic. There it is. You know, everything I'm saying, I've got a very particular system and it's worked with previous teams. Well, this is where it is completely stupid. I'm going to be crude here for a moment. Uh, and hopefully you're 18 plus uh, and an adult. Um, but look, okay. When you have girlfriends, right? Uh, or partners, sexual partners of any, I, you know, I, I speak from my heterosexual perspective. Uh, but uh, when you have a sexual partner, right, and you learn about them and you learn about their body and you know how to get them off, the things that you learn with that one person don't immediately translate. You're like, oh shit, I got this down, you know what I mean? Like I can, uh, I can make people come for days and you move into another relationship and you're like, oh my me, none of this is working. It doesn't work. It doesn't work on this person. What the fuck do I do? And you've got to completely relearn it. You can't just take... You know, sometimes it might work, and there's definitely some stuff that will work on you know, almost everybody, right? There's some good practices here, but it's the same with coaching. Your incredible system that you had over there worked for a particular set of people, and then you tr transport it across to this next set of people, different personalities, different cultures, you know, and you go, yep, yeah, well, this is how it all works now. Wait a minute, no one's getting off. And no one was getting off, and certainly weren't getting off in Team Liquid, and they definitely weren't getting off in fucking Optic. So when you yourself say this, like, as a coach, have a fucking word, like, oh, wait a minute. Hmm. Yeah, maybe the system's the issue, you know? You can't go fucking see more Skinner on it. Am I so out of touch? No. It is the children who are wrong. They're not, mate. It's you. So very interested that he can present that publicly say that all these other people say it as well too emotional too rigid too inflexible and at no point does he sit down a man whose job it is to kind of be insightful and aware and to see things no one else can see i mean being a visionary having vision is what a coach really needs and that's what separates the great coaches from just people who are coaching you know um and he, 
he, he puts that out there and, and there's no point as he's typing that to it longer. Oh, wait a minute. That's That could be the issue, couldn't it? Doesn't do it. So naturally, Optic uh, didn't want to bring him in. And apparently, by, by all accounts as well, uh, I, you know, I did hear that he was also kind of wanting to chime in and say, like, Hector and, and all the other people at Optic, I want to buy these players. And it's, you know, to, if Will and Rush leave, these are the guys we've got to get. These are the guys I want. And apparently some of the people on the team were like, uh, nah. And and again, I, I don't necessarily like the idea of a fucking wish list being presented. I want these players. Uh, Nico, <laughs> fucking Guardian, you know, like... At what point do you come back down to fucking planet Earth and get a grip of yourself? So it didn't work out at Optic. But again, doesn't matter. It was a trial. It was a one-month trial in a dysfunctional team, much like Team Liquid. So people are like, all right, well, you know, um, let's let's use him. So then there was the NRG uh, issue. And I'm, oh, hang on. I think... Yeah, no, 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 Optic, Optic was after NRG. Sorry, I thought I completely fucked up and was going to have to re-record the video. Uh, but no, he, so you, you, oh, no, no, my bad, I have, I have. Oh, well, fuck it, you get the point. Um, so before that, I should say, I'm gonna fuck re-recording it. There was the NRG issue. Now, NRG lasted very similarly to, to, to Optic. It lasted about as long as a fucking wine gum. You know, like I've had longer cups of coffee than his tenure in NRG. And I'll show you the slingshot report here. Um, Peacemaker out as coach, GM of NRG. This was the, the slingshot report. He went to NRG. Now, NRG, I'll t I've got some very good insight in NRG because I spent some time out there myself, you know, hanging out with the players and stuff in, in Vegas back when it was the Gobby, PTR, Ligia uh, kind of lineup. And they had Silent in there and Just Nine or whatever the fuck, however you say his name. Um, and and I, was, I, was, I was out there at that time, right? And I, I looked at that team and I was like, wow, if these guys had a really good coach because they've got a really good in-game leader and, a, and an in-game leader that works like no one else, if, if God B just had that support, th this would be perfect. And uh, th that never happened in time. And if you look at what Big have achieved, that should have been the NRG team. That's what was meant to be, and, and apparently Peacemaker didn't want it, and, and the organization weren't too sure if they wanted to fork out about it. Big should have been NRG, and they'd have been better off for it. Now, yes, there's some regional concerns. NRG, I think they wanted to be more NA-focused and NA-centric, but I'll tell you, any owner, what any owner should want is a, a, a functional team, a team that's capable of winning over... Uh, a team that doesn't win and doesn't have any identity and doesn't have any direction. Now, when Peacemaker uh, went to NRG, uh, apparently he just came in and was just like, "Yeah, yo guys, um, uh, th this is my this is my philosophy. This is what I want to do, and um, I want us to uh, buy some players and do all of this." And NRG were like, "No, that's not really what we need." Uh, what we need is kind of more of a supportive coach, not an authoritarian, glorious leader coach. We need somebody who's going to support the parts that we already have. And you can see here, he put a statement out after he left, which was an incredibly short amount of time, saying, when I accepted NRG's offer not long ago, I thought it was a great challenge, not only for me, but for NRG as well. I've said that before, and it's worth repeating. Building a team from scratch... And dealing with multiple different players at the same time made our lives a bit harder. Know thyself. Okay, well, yo, Louis, dude, you you don't build... A team from scratch as you go in and there's no cunt there. <laughs> you walk into an empty room and you put five people in it. You built something from scratch. There were people already there. You weren't building nothing from scratch. You, you had to... You had to work with what, that, that, you know, you've got to work with what was there. You've got to at least give these guys a chance. But he didn't. He, he, he didn't have the belief in that project. So he took the job thinking, yeah, they'll totally just let me do whatever the fuck I want at NRG. And it's like, well, no, it's not that simple, man. We already spent a lot of money to get these guys here. We're not going to just spend more because you don't 
rate these players on an individual basis. Make them better, please. Like, do something. So he says that, you know, know, know thyself. Yeah, okay, cool. Know what you've got. But why don't you learn about the players that are already there, dude? <laughs> you know, why not do that? Uh, and he goes, I know I will never commit to something I truly don't believe in. And during this process with NRG, we found ourselves with a couple of different visions concerning players and how we should move forward. It was a difficult decision, but I decided to step down and let NRG follow their vision without causing any drama or tension. Following your principles is never easy, but I believe in humility, grace, and passion. I'm not going to lie. This is probably the worst chapter of my CSGO career, but I'm hungry and really looking forward to my future in 2017. And then the optic thing I just talked about because they fucked it up happened. So... Again, you can see this pattern, you know, and he did the same shit at Optic. History did repeat itself after he left, uh, you know, NRG and, and kind of went there. So, at this juncture, you're like, well, fucking hell, man. Like, he'll change. He'll come around. So, an opportunity presents itself. Misfits. Now, at this juncture, the climb down from the Games Academy side that went on to be t uh, Tempo Storm... To misfits. In no disrespect to any of the players involved. No disrespect to that organization. But I mean. They're, let's say. I, I think it's fair to say that the org is new school. I'm not entirely sold on them yet. And the players they've got on the roster. I mean. Yeah. Alright. Again they're kind of punching above their weight. But they're in that mid middle of the pack NA melange. Which isn't particularly great. You know. And. And. It's, it's, as I see it, it's Sean Gare's project. Now, again, you've got Sean Gare's. There's an argument. Maybe Sean Gare should have moved into coaching, but I know he still wants to play. I don't know about that. If I was him, I'd, I'd be thinking now about the next phase of my career. He's married. He's getting older. Take a coaching job. You know, come, come, come on an analysis desk with me. You'll kill it. You know, you, you got the looks. You got the brains. You're great on camera. I worked with you in Cologne. Just saying, you know, Sean Gares could do whatever the fuck he wants in the space. He's criminally underused as a piece of uh, talent. I mean, criminally underused. So, uh, again, do we need a strong or authoritarian coach to come into this team? Well, no. That's the last thing you need, probably. Uh, and they did it. They went and got him because he's a name. Nobody really thought out. Nobody looked at anything on his CV or resume, and nobody looked at it and thought, well, this isn't a good fucking fit. So he comes in, and lo and behold, you've got your key games coming up. Key games, right? And, incredibly, Shazam, uh, you know, when Sh when Sean, like, it's so, in it's so mad to me. We've got a running joke uh, amongst the talent about... How Shazam must be <laughs> Shazam must be doing something we don't know about, right? Because Sean Gares is completely hitched himself uh, to Shazam and wants to play with him, uh, and and it works. I mean, Shazam statistically one of the strongest, if not the strongest, in the team, especially prior to the addition of the Frenchies, who were doing a lot better than I thought they would. Con congrats to them. Um, but uh, you've got the minor coming up. Don't rock the boat now. Don't rock the boat before a, a, a minor qualifier. Oh, well, no, nope. here's, what, here's what mysteriously happens out of the fucking blue. Oh, we're benching Shazam all of a sudden. What, we're benching our statistically strongest player, are we? Okay, makes sense to me. So we got benched. Now, nobody understands this. Nobody, nobody externally understands this. Uh, and they, you know, they'd already brought relics in as a replacement for Sean, who wasn't going to be able to compete anyway. So this is the dumbest time to substitute anybody. You're already without your fucking in-game leader. You're going to do enough as fucking coach. But no, we're, we're benching Shazam. And I heard, again, I heard the rumors, right? And I, I'll, some of them I won't repeat. But the bottom line is, uh, this is meant to have emanated from arguments. And this was uh, a, a penalty. This wasn't Shazam's not playing well. This wasn't Shazam isn't going to do a job for us at the minor. This is we've had a disagreement. So here you go. This will this will teach you. Well, it fucking penalizes the the whole team. It penalizes the fans. It penalizes the organization that are paying you fucking wages. 
This isn't the hill to die on. This isn't the time to make that fucking decision, is it? But that's what happened. And lo and behold, it's a few days later, and Peacemaker's out, and coincidentally, Shazam is back in the lineup. So you can see, June 3rd, when he, it was announced that he was being dropped, and then by June 13th, um, yeah, after a brief stint on the bench, mysteriously, uh, Shazam's back, and, uh, you know, Peacemaker, um, you know, what's, what, what's going on with him? So, Peacemaker, I, 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 again, I, I just don't know, you know, if he's in or out. I mean, it's no coincidence as well uh, that ZQS, a Brazilian player, comes in as a replacement for Shazam. You know, uh, oh, you've got a Brazilian coach, have you? A Brazilian authoritarian coach who has been at all of these teams... And Shazam's out and a Brazilian player comes in. I mean, fuck. It definitely couldn't be the coach that's done this, could it? I mean, it couldn't be. That would make no sense. I mean, Brazilian coach who knows Brazilian players intimately and a Brazilian player comes in and a guy who he knows got, you know, a big personality himself gets benched and you're an authority. Nah, this is crazy. But actually, Peacemaker did put out uh, this um, here. And you can see... This is his another twit long, kind of um, expressing it. Now, sorry, I did say uh, Peacemaker's out there. By you know, obviously he's he's not out of the organization. Uh, but my understanding is that his role is kind of a, is diminished now as a result of this internalized friction. Um, so he's still in the organization, um, but with Sean returning, it's uh, you know, is is he the uh, the person? calling all of the shots that he likes, you know, my advice would be to watch this space. But he says here, first of all, I would like to apologize for our bad performance in the past couple of matches, tournaments. To Misfits as an organ for all of my fans out there, I've seen people saying I should be ashamed, but I'm not at all. I was living with these guys these past months and I know how hard we worked these last couple of days and how pressured we felt to perform in this event due to a lot of circumstances. And after we found out Shaw wouldn't be able to attend the minor, we knew it would be very hard. Losing an in-game leader isn't easy at all, but we still decided to bring Relics back in and we truly appreciate him for the time with us and for the amount of dedication he put in even after being originally benched from our team. You are amazing, and I wish you nothing but the best for the future. I'm not going to go too deep about Shazam being benched and the roster moves. I wouldn't either, Louis. Uh, but there's uh, but there's things I can say. First, it wasn't my own decision, as a lot of people are saying out there. And people are, and second, things are way deeper than people think it is. It makes me very frustrated to see the amount of hate me and all my players are getting. Well, the players aren't getting any hate. It, it's pretty much you, dude. Uh, when people don't know half what happens inside our teams. Internal decisions issues stay inside the team. I mean, they don't. There's no secrets in Counter-Strike. And will never be made public. That's how it is in any professional environment. Uh, you can see here. So we said we didn't have many options. So I went with uh, you know, ZQK uh, for the for the minor since he was fully available to come ass up and start practicing with us. We also appreciate all the amount of work he did, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and you can see, I'm not really sure what the future holds for us, in, even if I will stay in Misfits. So I don't think he's going to stay. I mean, that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier, based on what I've been told. So at this juncture, right, this, this is rock fucking bottom. I mean, it is. It's rock bottom. The idea that a guy who has successfully coached teams and, and players that have gone on to compete in international tournaments to win international tournaments, and right now you can't even tie down fuck a job in Rene, um, a job in Misfits. Come on, dude. Like you've got to start. A, you know, know thyself. You said it. You got to start looking at what you're doing and not the players, and not the orgs, and not the setup, because your approach isn't going to work in 90% of the teams you play in. Just, you just got to wake up to that fact, dude. You just got to wake the fuck up and start changing your approach. And if you don't want to, don't say you're humble, because that's not what a humble person does. I mean, that is the height of arrogance. Now, you might, you might be rightly arrogant, but we're never going to know, because you're never going to be in the top team as things stand, again, and you're never going to win a trophy, again, at all, <laughs> it's not going to happen, so you, that, that'd that be my advice, now, I did say earlier, that I compared him uh, to Villa, to, to Villas Boas, um, Villa Boas, uh, the Portuguese uh, manager, and I just want to show you, 
the parallels, all right? Because even though I can tell you the anecdote, when you see it in black and white, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. So here he is, you know, young guy, only 39, right? And he started at, uh, you know, uh, Academica, and then he goes to Porto. And this is the 2010, the huge domestic triple season. He goes to Chelsea. It's a fucking nightmare. He can't get the dressing room on side. But then people went, you know, he spent one season there. Right, this was the guy who's meant to be the replacement for Mourinho, you know, the special one, the guy who's going to bring back the magic, you know, like he, he was going to be the guy, right? He was going to be the next Mourinho, the next great manager at Chelsea. Doesn't happen, so he goes to fucking Tottenham. One year there, and that didn't work out either because his approach doesn't work in the Premier League. Not to worry, gets a top job in Russia, Zenith Saint Petersburg, right? But no, doesn't really work out there. Yes, he, uh, you know, gets some fucking, uh, you know, has some good times. You know, gets them into the UEFA Champions League, this sort of thing. Uh, you know, but ultimately after two seasons, he's out. And now he's at fucking Shanghai SIPG. You know, replacing washed up motherfuckers like Sven Joran Eriksson. 39. The f you know, the former special one too. He, his existence was getting everyone to be like, fucking hell, maybe Portugal's going to produce all the best managers in the world. What's going on? What are they doing over there? Everyone's having a look. You know? No, it turns out, actually, the guy uh, was an egomaniac and completely fucked himself up because he couldn't defer, uh, you know, Drogba or John Terry, you know, these absolute legends at Chelsea. Like, who the fuck are you? Yes, you're a manager. Yes, you're the boss. But sometimes you've got to fucking just concede a little bit of ground. That's all you have to do and get people on side, you know, I uh, always remember uh, what Ibrahimovic uh, said, and uh, he said, you know, he, that there's managers that he would play for, but he would die for Mourinho, and that's what he said when they were at Inter Milan together, and it's that kind of loyalty that's going to put you in good stead in Counter-Strike, that doesn't mean you got to be uh, a bitch that just placates players, but you got you can't just come in and be completely authoritarian and all up in people's faces and expect to succeed. It's just it's just never going to happen that way. Not for fucking five years at least. Um, so yeah. So those are some thoughts about coaching philosophy, in particular Peacemaker. Uh, it's probably been too long as per, but fuck it. You know, people say they enjoy the longer videos. If you don't, if you want a TLDW. Whatever, fuck it. Uh, be sure anyway to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, you can see the, the merch store is now open if you want to get yourself a, a t-shirt or a mug. I strongly recommend you do. Um, and we've got some more gear coming out. Uh, but other than that, you look after yourselves, and I'll see you on the next video. Peace.